Hello, it's John Buck back again. Uh, I'm going to show you today, talk about when we take the sums of random variables, how do we find the PDF? The derivation I'm going to do uh, is for the continuous case, but the discrete case is, is pretty much the same, only with uh, discrete convolution. I'll say a little bit about that at the end. But again, so again, the focus for today is the PDF for the sum of two random variables. So let me, uh, let me start by saying a little bit about our strategy. So again, the topic to define the PDF, the sum of two random variables. So again, we're going to assume z is equal to some x plus y, or x Uh, let me uh, let me say it this way for now x and x and, and y have a joint PDF that's f of x y. Okay, our strategy or a plan here. It's always good to go and think a little bit about your plan of what the best way to approach the problem is here is to to find the CDF first, and this is a good strategy. And a lot of probability problems where I need to find a PDF if I'm not really sure how to proceed. Find the CDF first because that's a well-defined event. And then take the derivative. So we're going to find the CDF, I should have been clear, for Z. So that's a capital F of Z. Right, which just by the definition, all CDFs, this is the probability that the random variable z is less than or equal to some outcome little z. And then we're going to take the derivative with respect to little z. So that's back to basic ideas about PDFs and CDFs. And I just I wanted to bring that out there because this is a very common good strategy. If you're looking at a problem where you have to find a PDF and you don't know exactly where to go, trying to do it in terms of the CDF is usually the best plan. And so it's probably worth starting off just sort of having a picture of what we're doing here. If this is y, and this is x, we can say the event for d of z, right, the border of this event, I have some line, right, this is the line x plus y equals z, right, and so the event we're interested in, z less, you know, the capital Z is less than little z, is this region over here. So this shaded region, we might call d sub z, is the, the event space for that, and we intercept, right, both at when, when y is 0, x is z, when y, x is 0, y is z. So it's this line here, and then we're interested in, so what's the probability that we're in this region? We would get that by integrating the CDF, or integrating the joint PDF over this region, and then taking the derivative of that. So let's start that, we'll, we'll start that on a, on a new page. So for step one, right, so again, our step one is find probability that capital Z, the random variable, is less than or equal to some outcome little z. And we just said that's the, the definition of our CDF. And that's the line we just saw up there. So we're going to say I want to take the double integral over the region D of Z of my joint PDF. Right? That's one of the fundamental properties of the PDF, the joint PDF is I can find the probability of any event by integrating the PDF over the region of all outcomes in that event. Well, again, going back to that page, we said, well, that says, for example, for each x, we're going to integrate from minus infinity up until this point here. So if I want to rewrite this, this is the line x plus y equals z, but if I want to write it in the integral, I'm going to say, well, y, the, the upper limit on y is equal to z minus x, right, if I just resolve this equation. Right, so I'm going to take the integral, I'm going to go over all the values of x, and for each x, y is going to go from, so maybe just to make it clear, this is x for the first integral, y for the inner integral, and y is going from minus infinity up to z minus x, that's that covering that region for each x, of 
f of xy, the joint PDF. So the inner integral is dy, and then the second integral is dx. And I can probably emphasize that order even a little bit more by putting this one inside the blocks. And that's really as far as I need to go finding the joint PDF. I can't simplify it anymore in general because I don't know anything about f of xy. Okay, so for step two, I now say, well, I know the PDF is equal to the derivative with respect to z of the CDF. All right, so now I can plug in that expression with the integral I just had. So this is as x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Inside that I have an integral as y goes from minus infinity up to z minus x. Right? Those are all the outcomes of x and y that satisfy big z less than or equal to little z. And I'm integrating the joint PDF over this region and then integrating again with respect to x. So I want to take the derivative of this integral. The first easy step is I can bring the derivative inside the first integral. So I can say, well, this is equal to, I do that, I get the same integral for x. And now I have the derivative inside the integral, because I can change their order. So I have the derivative of the integral of y going from y is still going from minus infinity to z minus x times f of xy dy and then dx outside all of this. And now I need to reach back into my calculus toolbox and pull out something called Leibniz's rule. Right, let, me, uh, let me pop ahead a page and I'll put Leibniz's rule. Also, I'll try to remember to put a link in the description to, to if I can see a Wikipedia page or something, I'm sure I can find a reference on that. But in general, what Leibniz's rule talks about is what happens When I take a derivative of an integral, where, where parts of the integral are functions of the thing I'm differentiating with. So I have, I'm taking d, d, z, and if I have either the limits or the integrand itself are functions of, uh, functions of z, what Leibniz's rule says is I get the uh, derivative of the upper limit, so I get db dz times the integrand evaluated at the upper limit here. So replacing, I'm integrating with respect to x, so I replace the x at the upper limit here minus the derivative of the lower limit times the integrand evaluated at that lower limit plus the integral, and I bring the derivative inside, and I have the partial of the integrand with respect to x. All right, so I have, I have this integral, the derivative of this integral becomes the, 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 two, the, upper, the function evaluated at the upper and lower limits, each scaled by the derivative of those limits, plus the whole integral so this should be a going a to, from a to b of the derivative of the integrand. So basically, how much does the upper limit change, scaled by the value at the upper limit, pulling away how much the lower limit changes? Because, for example, if a is increasing with z, that's contracting the region of integration, removing area from underneath it. And again, if you're not familiar, you should be able to find this in the calculus textbook. And again, I'll try to put a link uh, either uh, to some reference to, to help you review this. But this is an important tool. If we go back now... To our page, we say, well, when I take the derivative with respect to z, I'm, I'm, this is actually a pretty easy one because, in general, well, minus infinity has is zero; it's a constant, doesn't depend on z. The integrand is a general rule right here; it doesn't depend on z. The only thing that depends on z is the upper limit, right? So if I let me just touch this up, that should remind me. 
So if I come back to this, I'm going to say I'm going to have an integral, in this case, as x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And here I'm going to get the derivative. Here I was integrating with respect to y, so it would be the second argument that I plug in. So I have the upper limit d dz of this is 1, right, times this integrand evaluated. Since I'm integrating with respect to y, I put that in to the upper limit. So I have f of x, y times x, z minus x. Then I have, uh, I have minus the, the derivative of the lower limit, but that's 0, right? So I take the derivative of the lower limit, this gives 0, and then I have plus the integrand times the partial derivative here with respect to f, but that's 0 also. So I'm, I'm lucky that, that actually most of these terms are very simple, and what Leibniz rule leaves me with is this, and I can, I can clean that up some. Which says I take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of x, y, x, z minus x, dx. And this is my PDF with respect to z. So actually what this is saying is that for each x I find the point in y that, that I need, right? That sum of these two is still z. So I say if I want the sum to be z, I find the two values of x and y. If I go back a page, what I basically say is I'm integrating the CDF along this line it works out. But by the time I follow my careful strategy here, all I'm saying is that the, I'm integrating a, a line across a line on this on the PDF here. Right, so so this is my PDF in general for the sum of two random variables. The interesting result that we exploit a lot is to take it one step further, which is to say if what if those two random variables are independent? If x and y are independent random variables. Then we know the joint PDF is the product of the marginals. Right? So f of x, y is f of x times f of y. And that lets me simplify things one step further, which says that the joint PDF is now the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of x, x times f of y z minus x dx. And that, when we look at it for a second, we recognize as our old friend or nemesis, depending on your experience, convolution. Right? So that it's saying that, which, which is not something we often think about in random things if we're coming from electrical engineering, right? We think of convolution telling us about how to find the output of an LTI system from an input and an impulse response, but it's saying the same mathematical operation is how I combine the two PDFs of independent random variables to find their sum. All right, so to, just to summarize that, that the, the PDF of the sum of two independent, and that's important, don't assume it if you don't know it, but if I know the two random variables are independent, random variables is the convolution of their individual PDFs. So that's turned out to be a very important result. When I have two things that are independent, I can convolve their PDFs to find the output of the sum thinking back to our linear systems experience, we say, well, convolution was often really complicated and messy to implement. And so we very soon afterwards moved to ideas like transforms, like Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms, to avoid doing convolutions where we could. And so, not surprisingly, one of the next steps we're going to talk about is something called the moment generating function or the characteristic function, where it says I can avoid doing these convolutions by that these things are the Fourier transforms of the PDFs. So if I have to convolve PDFs, I will multiply 
their moment generating functions to find the new moment generating function of the sum and then do an inverse transform. So there'll be times, just as we saw in linear systems, where it's sometimes easier to take the Fourier transforms of, of two things and multiply them, and then inverse Fourier transform is easier than doing a convolution. We'll see the same thing here. All right, so I'll pause here for now. Uh, I'll go on soon in alpha 